Okay. Good day, everyone. I am Anna Paula Galiemit, and this is Group 4, and we will be discussing enterprise risk management, specifically focusing on the corporate risk management. Next slide. So first, what is corporate risk management? Basically, corporate risk management works to ensure the safety of the business, guarding it from the risk of injury or of financial loss. It helps optimize risk taking of an organization. So it is a process of planning, organizing, leading and controlling the activities of the organization to minimize the effects of risk that the business may experience. This may not guarantee that the organization will not be impacted by conditions within their establishment, but how it will, however, provide objective and consistent information to decision makers to plan ways on how risk is managed. Next slide. Going back to the definition of enterprise risk management that was reported by the third group, it is defined as a process affected by an entity's BODs, management, and other personnel applied in strategy setting and across the enterprise, designed to identify potential events that may affect the entity and manage risk to be within its risk appetite to provide reasonable assurance regarding the achievement of entity objectives. So ERM is a broader concept of risk management and it provides a comprehensive and integrated approach to address corporate risk. So it's like the blueprint for corporate risk management. Next slide. So what are the risks that I was talking about? So these are first business risk. Um, it is the risk faced by the business from its internal and external environment, such as the business's weaknesses and the threats like economic downfall and competition. Next is financial risk. This refers to bankruptcy arising from the possibility of the firm not being able to repay its debts on time. Next is market risk. So market risk is the risk of a value of a firm's investments going down as a result of market movements. So it's also referred to as the price risk. Then it, next is interest rate risk. This is the risk of an adverse effect of interest rate movements on a firm's profit or balance sheet. Then exchange risk. Exchange risk is the possibility of an adverse effect on the firm's assets, liabilities, or income as a result of exchange rate movements, since exchange rate movements are always fluctuating. Next is default risk. This is the risk associated with non-recovery of the sums due from outsiders, which may arise due to the inability to pay or unwillingness to do so. So if na ay mga debtors nga nangutang sa com company, then they can't pay their sums due. So they the company may be exposed to default risk. Then lastly, liquidity risk. This refers to the risk associated with the inability of the firm to meet its financial obligations, which poses a threat to its financial position or in existence. Next reporter. Hi, I'm Celine Masicampo, and I'll be discussing the next topic, which is the need for implementing ERM. So as discussed, enterprise risk management is a management process that is about designing and implementing capabilities for managing the risks that matter. So it empowers the board and management to make more in informed risk or return decisions by addressing fundamental requirements with respect to governance and policy risk analytics, risk management, and monitoring and reporting. Next slide, please. So the items shown are the six fundamental reasons for implementing ERM. So first, it reduces unacceptable performance variability. So ERM assists management with evaluating the likelihood and impact of major events 
and the developing responses to either prevent those events from occurring or manage their effect, if, impact on the entity if they do occur. So ERM assists management with improving the consistency of operating performance by increasing the emphasis on reducing earnings volatility, avoiding earnings-related surprises, and managing key performance indicator shortfalls. So thus, implementing ERM improves the ability to respond to significant events, management, manage sources of value, reduce their cost of risk mitigation, improve performance of critical processes or accomplish strategic initiatives. So second reason, is it align and integrate varying views of risk management? So there are many silos within organizations with a point of view on managing risk, such as insurance, treasury, succession planning, system security, and IT business continuity. So with the silo mentality, it inhibits efficient allocation of resources and management of common risk enterprise-wide. So thus, there is a need to have a common, frame, common framework when there are multiple functions managing multiple risks. So an example would be to increase transparency by developing quantitative and qualitative measures of risk or aggregating common risk exposures across multiple business units with the objective of understanding the greatest threat to enterprise value and formulating an integrated risk response. So another reason is it build confidence of investment community and stakeholders. So building confidence through improving transparency in the risk management capabilities and performance. It is because institutional investors, rating agencies, and regulators talk more about the importance of risk management in their assessments of companies Management may be requested to disclose and comment on the organization's capability for understanding and manage, managing risk to enable stockholders to make informed assessments as to whether returns are adequate in relation to the risk undertaken. Thus, as companies increase the transparency of their risk and risk management capabilities and improve the maturity of their capabilities around managing critical risk, Management will be able to articulate more effectively how well they are handling existing and emerging industry issues. So next reason is it enhances corporate governance. So as we know, ERM and corporate governance are totally linked. Thus, augmenting board and management interaction, assessing the need for a senior level risk management committee and, cl and clarifying roles, responsibilities, authorities, and and accountabilities will enhance corporate governance. So the fifth reason is it successfully respond, it helps in successfully responding to a changing business environment. So given that the business environment continues to change, new risks emerge and the pace of change accelerates. So organizations must become better at identifying, prioritizing and planning for risk. So ERM assists management with evaluating the assumptions underlying the existing business model, the effectiveness of the strategies around, around executing that model and the information available for decision making. So ERM drives management to identify alternative future scenarios, evaluate the likelihood and severity of those scenarios, identify priority risks, and improve the organization's capabilities around managing those risks. Then lastly, Implementing our ERM aligned strategy and corporate culture. So ERM helps management create risk awareness and an open positive culture with respect to risk and risk management. So in such an environment, individuals can raise issues without fear of retribution. So in an enterprise wide importance, ERM often centralizes policy setting and creates focus, discipline and control. Thus, ERM encourages balance in both the entrepreneurial activities and control activities of the organization so that neither one is so disproportionately strong relative to the other. So to note, traditional risk management approaches are focused on protecting the tangible assets and the related contra contractual rights and obligations. However, ERM is more focused on enhancing business strategy. Its scope and application is broader than protecting physical and financial assets. So with an ERM approach, the scope of risk management is enterprise-wide and the application of risk management 
is targeted to enhancing as well as protecting the unique combination of tangible and intangible assets comprising the organization's business model. So in summary, ERM must be implemented to improve strategic decision making for organizations with dynamic business operations that leave them more exposed to various threats and negative consequences. That's all. Next reporter. Good afternoon, I am Warren Chan A. Gonzalez, and now let us proceed with the next part of this report, which is about ERM process developing a more risk-aware culture. Next slide, please. There is nothing more crucial to the success of ERM efforts in an organization than an informed and supportive culture. Now, what is culture? The definition of culture can be based on a question, what determines how decisions are made in an organization? The key to culture in the context of VRM is the impact it has on business decisions. A strong culture is one in which decisions are made in a disciplined way, taking into account considerations of risk and reward on an informed basis. However, disciplined decision-making in the context of VRM kind doesn't necessarily mean na walay risk involved. Rather, it means that decisions that create undue risk or kanang risk involved ganit kay significant kayo na mostly kay dili makontrol sa organization either because they take the organization out of its defined risk appetite or because the reward is not sufficient for the risk taken, relative decisions are avoided. Next slide, please. Now, what are the goals of culture? The goals the goal of a risk-aware culture is to ensure that all business decision-makers decision understand and behave, recognizing the following. First is the importance of identifying and assessing risk in the current and potential business activities. Then the importance of, of communicating current and potential risk. And lastly, the importance of taking risk and reward into account in business decisions. Again, it is worth stating that the goal is to ensure that decisions taken throughout the organization are taken with these goals in mind. That means that the risk of, that the risk aware, aware culture must extend throughout the organi organization, meaning it must not be limited in a in a specified group, like for example, senior officers who are usually responsible for being leaders or making business decisions, meaning it should be communicated communicated throughout the organization. Next slide, please. Now, let's discuss on how to create a risk-aware culture. Creating a risk-aware culture requires a deliberate approach. It will not happen overnight. To do so, the following steps and approaches are suggested to accomplish the introduction of a strong risk-aware culture. First is defining the elements. The first step to creating a risk-aware culture is to know what elements that culture should contain. Pasabot ani kay, dapat ganit maklaro unsay characteristics sa kanang culture that should be present which will help the organization to be more risk-aware in ERM context. Some, some possible elements may include acting with integrity, understanding impacts on customers, embedded risk management, full and transparent communication, collaborative decision-making, and alignment of incentives. So those those are just some of the possible elements in a culture. Next is the measuring and monitoring. Results in most business endeavors are achieved by having measures of, of success and monitor, monitoring progress toward goals using these measures. So na discuss naman nato before na kailangan nato measures to keep track of our progress and monitor Ma monitor po nato whether we are getting closer or farther away sa tong objectives. The same can be true for progress toward cultural goals as well as financial ob objectives or the implementation of operational objectives. Measurement can be based on non-financial information because as discussed also before na sometimes or most of the time kay dili sufficient na uh, sa financial information na mag mag rely. For example, if a defined element of an organization's risk culture is particip participative management style or collaborative decision making, there is likely no source of information available except to ask people within the organization about how decisions are made based on their experience. Next is the involvement and buy-in. A step that can significantly increase the success of buy-in process is the involvement of the organization or at least key people within the organization in the definition of this of the desired culture. 
Buy-in is a precious product of trust in a business relationship. If employees believe that their leader has integrity, then they will begin to buy in to or commit to or own their way of working together. Involvement, on one hand, in the creation of an objective is one of the best ways to create buy-in for any goal. Importante niya ang involvement and buy-in kay ang employees, especially, especially those na under sa Osaka senior officer who usually serves as a leader, will generally develop ownership of goals and objectives that they, will, that they work to create. Next is openness. A strong risk culture cannot exist in an, in an organization that, is, that discourages open communication. Full and transparent communication is an integral par, part of a risk-aware aware culture. Ideas and questions must be encouraged and not explicitly or implicitly discouraged. Negative behavior can occur in many ways. One of those ways kai when individuals, particularly senior, senior level ones, may dominate discussions with the implication that other points of view are discouraged. So, ang openness kai dapat mo-consider po sila sa feelings or sa thoughts sa other people, despite of the positions. Next is a tone from the top. With culture... Tone is critical, and the support must be behavioral as well as, as simply providing fu- funding or resources. It is up to leadership to effectively de- define the culture of the organization by encouraging, discouraging, and exhibiting certain be- behaviors. So, usually, kay ang, kay, ifollow man sa mga, lalo na sa mga lower level, ganyan, em- na employee officers, kay ifollow man nila ang ilang leader or those in the top. So, the top officers must lead as an example as a good example in practice, practicing the culture so that everyone will follow next is the alignment of incentives and rewards or walking the talk incentives and rewards and the importance of their alignment with corporate objectives cannot be overemphasized employees will exhibit behaviors that are rewarded and or that minimize stress in the workplace incentive compensation systems implicitly put value on certain results so we all know that rewards are important in order to motivate the employees to work harder now what does enterprise risk management have to do with creating a more risk aware culture many public and public many public and private sector organizations are making risk awareness part of their inter- internal cult- culture by putting risk management front and center for all employees, not, not just those with risk in, the, in their title. A risk-aware culture adopts the notion that everyone is a risk manager. That's why I, I mentioned earlier that it should be communicated throughout the organization. A risk-aware culture drives risk management down to the individ, individual level. Amid the coronavirus pandemic, Organizations learn just how important it is to be agile and quickly adapt to changing conditions. Pushing risk, risk responsibilities out to the edges of an organization helps decision makers quickly identify changing conditions and take corrective actions to mitigate emerging threats before they can escalate into something more harmful. Next slide, please. Now, let us discuss the essence of ERM. So its essence is for the for monitoring the performance of an organization with respect to corporate objectives it is imperative to form control mechanisms that enable the, the identification of risk and which meet the predefined objectives risk is a synonym for uncertainty its unpredictability as accounting students our point of view may be centered around organizational results rel- relative to this topic which is ERM Risk aware, risk aware, aware culture. In that context, the essence of the enterprise risk management is very simple. It is the group of organizational activities that try to improve results by making the unpredictable a little more a little more predictable. Managing risk is simply taking steps to make each goal a little more cert- certain. Risk management consists those activities that decrease, if not fully eliminate uncertainty to help you get what you want and avoid what you don't want. So the things that you want to, to avoid kay if, for example, ang risk involved kay sobrahan ka significant compared sa benefits nga possible ni makuha. In essence, ERM is meant to empower business managers to make smarter decisions that maximize value, reduce cost, 
and balance risk and return. Next reporter. Um, hello, my name is Jaime Antonio A. Garcia, and I'll be reporting on the COSA ERM framework. So first of all, what is the COSA ERM framework, or what is COSA? COSA is the Commission of Sponsoring Organization of the Treadway Commission. The initial mission of the COSA was to study financial reporting and develop recommendations to prevent fraud. Next slide, please. So what is COSA ERM framework? The COSA ERM framework, or the Enterprise Risk Management, is one of two widely accepted risk management standards organizations used to help manage risks in an increasingly turbulent and unpredictable business landscape. So why is it important to know about this? Um, it gives the management of your organization the responsibility to ensure um, they have a set job strategies in such a way that it reduces the threats. So the objectives of the businesses are designed in a way that they are tolerant to risk, which will thus allow your business to thrive despite the threats of the business. Next slide, please. So what does COSO ERM framework do? It provides a more holistic approach that enables the alignment of the organization's strategy and operation, operational and compliance processes across the entire company for managing all the key businesses risk and opportunities with the goal of maximizing the value for the en entire enterprise. Next slide, please. So what does the cube mean or what does the framework mean? So there is a direct relationship between objectives which are an entity strives to achieve, the enterprise risk management component, which represents what is needed to achieve them, and the relationship is depicted in a three-dimensional matrix in form of a cube. So as you can see, in the face of the cube, it shows that enterprise risk management consists of eight interrelated components. These components are derived from the way management runs an enterprise and are integrated with the management process. So to further dive into the different components, first we have the internal environment. This is mostly, it encompasses the tone of an organization and it sets the basis of how risk is viewed and addressed by the entity's people and by its risk appetite. Next is the objective setting. Um, this must exist before the management can identify potential events affecting their achievement. It ensures that management has a place in a process to set objectives and that the chosen objectives support, the, support and align the entity's mission and are consistent with its risk appetite. Next is the event identification. Basically, this is this talks about all about affecting achievement of an entity's objectives and must be identified, distinguished between the risk and the opportunities. Next would be the risk assessment. So this is where the risks are analyzed, considering likelihood and impact as basis for determining how should it be managed. So risks are assessed on an inherent and residual basis. Next is risk response. It's managed, it is where the management selects risks responses, avoiding, accepting, reducing, or sharing risk. Here, it develops a set of actions to align risks with an entity's risk tolerance and risk appetite. Next is control activities. Here, it is the policies and procedures where they establish and implement in order to help ensure the risk response are effectively carried out within an organization. Next would be the information and communication component. Here, relevant information is identified, captured, and communicated in a form and time frame that enables people to carry out their responsibilities and also have an effective communication in a broader sense flowing down across, up, across and up the entity. The last component is monitoring. Here, the entirety of the enterprise risk management is monitored and modifications are made as necessary. However, however, monitoring is accomplished through ongoing management activities, separate evaluations, or both. And these components are aligned with the four objectives categories as seen on the top of the cube, the strategic operations and reporting compliance. Um, and that 
is all for the causal ERM framework. Next reporter, please. So good day. I'm Ripner Volta Rebitimbal for the topic risk retention and reduction. So basically, uh, risk retention is the decision made after careful assessment and evaluation as to retaining the inherent risk where the benefits outweighs or is overpowered by it. It is also called a self-insurance as for this kind of strategy is only applicable or feasible when the risks are small enough to be transferred or converted into costs that may be higher than the loss arising out of the risk itself. However, it may also be so significant that it cannot be insured, so it has to be foregone when the eventuality occurs, such as occurrence of acts of God or incidents when there are natural calamities and war. So here are certain factors to be considered for risk retention. First is the measurable or appropriate returns, wherein this means that if, this, if certain returns are measurable and the risk borne with it, through speculations and foresight and right amount of company leadership, management will be able to calculate whether uh, the benefits outweighs the risk of the benefits uh, or of the work of the risk. So based on the word num for number two, based on the word itself, um, immateriality, or it is understandable that if the risk is insignificant enough to make major changes and effects, it may as well be simply neglected. For number three, we have low probability and bearable. That That is if the risk possibility of occurrence has a low probability and that the fund built within the system to overcome losses and risks can bear the figures if it occurs. For number four, the familiarity resulted into preparedness where the subject or when management has encountered certain risks and is familiar with its nature, then a proactive approach can already be easily implemented where it would not put the company in harm's way when as it is no longer comes by surprise. So for, next slide. So to guide a company in assessing for retention of risks, the company may opt to evaluate the level of risk through estimations by using certain methods and financial figures that will help such as sales projection, cash flows, liquidated damages, and the like. For the second one, there is as there is no precise method of estimating risks, uh, the company may use statistical averages through historical data to help determine the level of risks and possible losses. So a great example would be bad debts that occur in a pattern over a period of time. So third, for finally, to help the company in overcoming risk, management should ascertain the capacity of the company, company funds to negate the losses. Next slide, please. So now moving on to risk re reduction or optimization of risk aims to reduce the severity of the implementation of loss or the probability of loss not being passed. Next slide, please. So here are some key points as to why risk retention may also be called as, uh, uh, risk reduction may also be called as mitigation. So risk reduction is also referred to as mitigation as it includes all measures taken to reduce the effect of the hazard itself, as well as the vulnerable conditions leading to the hazard, and in a way that it mitigates physical, economic, and social vulnerability. It is also called as mitigation as it takes certain steps to mitigate a hazard and lessen costs that results from it thereof, while trying to eliminate the possibility of reducing more damage when actions are being done than that of when it was being left dormant. So also as a way of preparedness, which may be a disaster preparedness plan or in, a, or in certain aspects where familiarity of the nature of the risk is available. And lastly, mitigation as it takes measures which may be active or passive to reduce both the effect of the hazard itself and conditions vulnerable to it in order to reduce the scale of a future disaster and its impacts. That would be all. Hello, good day everyone. I am Yujel Kabahog, your next reporter who will be discussing the mitigation and training strategy. So as what was discussed by Mr. Timbal, mitigation embraces all measures taken in order to reduce both 
the effect of the hazard itself and the conditions vulnerable to it in order to reduce the scale of a future disaster. So this basically means that preventive measures in order to lessen the impacts of the hazard to the community. Mitigation also includes measures which were aimed at reducing the physical, economic, and social vulnerability. So therefore, mitigation may include or incorporate other community-related issues. Next slide, please. So um, the community-based mitigation strategy, this strengthens and stabilizes the efforts of the administration. This means that the effective involvement of the community or the people within that certain community and the public awareness can largely minimize or greatly reduce the impacts of the disaster. So this um, community involvement is very essential in order to lessen the impacts of the disaster. The focus is of the community-based mitigation strategy is the capacity building of the community, which includes the formation of community emergency response teams, or also known as CERT, which we have in our town and also in our city. So we all know that CERT is, this is a program that educates volunteers about the disaster preparedness for the hazard that might come um, in the future and what could be the possible impact of this hazard in their area and also to train them in basic disaster response skills like for example fire safety and light search and rescue next slide please so mitigation strategy also focuses on micro risk assessment and vulnerability analysis like for example hazard mapping um, locating areas that are um, prone to dangerous situation in order to improve their, their quality of forecast and also to disseminate warning quickly. So mitigation also highlights the need for a disaster management legislation and permanent administrative structures, as well as relief and rehabilitation policy. So the following are some of the guidelines to managing disaster. Like, for example, the importance of land use planning and regulations for sustainable development. Next slide, please. For the training strategy, so as we all know that without a training plan, warning, and evacuation manuals, and without the duties of those who are belong in emergency operations center and district control room, the disaster management action plan or DMAP cannot be completely utilized. So this simply means that a successful implementation of DMAP, this depends on the training of the key community and social functionaries. So the list of activities that must be completed by the responsible branch authority, it is included in the manual as well as information important, contact person emergency officials. That's all. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. As what I said, um, the manuals list the tasks to be undertaken to the responsible branch authority, as well as the information and important contact persons within a community. That's all. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mayor Danica Sayago, and I'm going to report about community-based preparedness strategy. So um, preparedness involves measures taken in anticipation of a disaster to ensure that appropriate and effective actions are taken during the emergency, such as setting up the systems for early warning, evacuation and emergency operations management, public awareness and disaster and evacuation drills. So emergency responses are measures undertaken to ensure survival and prevent further deterioration of the situation. It is therefore essential that a plan for community preparedness be put into place. And the following points must be incorporated in the strategy. Um, next slide, please. First is to have a clearly 
perceived vision of hazards and developed hazard profile of the community and its neighborhoods. So the most important aspect of preparing a preparedness strategy is to understand the hazards facing the community. Understanding the various hazards risk is the first part of mitigating the adverse effects of future events. It was thought that um, each hazard was unique. So therefore, mitigation strat strategies should also be unique. And so by having a clear vision of hazard, decision makers are able to identify and rank the hazards that should be given the most attention and funding. So for example, earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanic eruptions all occur without little warning time. Therefore, a mitigation and response plan could be created for rapid onset hazards. Next is the assessment of risk and vulnerability. So a risk and vulnerability assessment is the fundamental building block in the community preparedness strategy. Without visibility into potential exposure, it is um, difficult to know where to focus your funds and resources. So a vulnerability assessment identifies, quantifies, and prioritizes the risks and vulnerabilities in a system. And a risk assessment identifies recognized threats and threat actors and the probability that um, these factors will result in an exposure or loss. So with this assessment, um, people will gain knowledge or, or will gain a thorough understanding of the vulnerabilities and threats that exist in the environment and the likelihood that they can be exploited and, have, and how it can impact the community. Third is to is the identification of individual and community resources. So this um, step allows you to involve community members from the very beginning of the process. This encourages both trust in the plan and community buy-in and support, not, not only of the assessment, but of whatever actions are taken as a result of the community-based preparedness strategy. So full community participation in planning and carrying out an assessment also promotes le leadership from within the community and gives voice to those who may feel they have none. Fourth is um, that the plan must be, um, it's not written there, but um, it must be clear and simple, specific in details, also define duties and responsibilities of each member, earmark various escape routes and locate shelter sites. So just like any other plan, um, the community-based um, preparedness plan must also be clear and simple so that everyone will understand the plan and it should, it should, it should also be specific so as not to confuse the evacuation process and search and rescue operation and any um, dissemination of information. Next is that um, the strategy, the strategy written should should have a simple, concise checklist. So completing a summary checklist ensures that the community-based disaster strategy is comprehensive. So this checklist should include the medical needs, evacuation routes, um, care plans for your service animals, shelter sites, and many more. So this checklist is put into place so that one does not have to refer to it in depth when emergency rises. Lastly is to form resilient focal communities or target groups. This is for easy dissemination of information about the um, strategy. Um, next slide, please. Moving on, we have the Geographic Information System, or what we call as the GIS. So disaster planning involves predicting the risk of natural hazard and possible impact. The use of GIS can be made successfully in communication, risk and vulnerability assessment, and study of loss patterns, search, and etc. So hazard maps could be created for cities, districts, state, or even for the entire country. So hazard maps prove helpful for analysis and determination of hazard zones and likely effects during disasters. So these maps can be successfully used in establishing response priorities, developing action plans, quick disaster location assessment for carrying out search and rescue operations effectively, zoning them accordingly to risk magnitudes, um, population details, and asset at risk. 
So the geographic information system facilitates record keeping and obtains status or ongoing works, which are the most critical task disaster management. So in conclusion, um, we all know that disaster cannot be prevented totally. However, um, timely warning and planning can minimize the effect of disasters. And an accurate um, disaster management plans needs to be prepared. And also the use of modern technology such as the geographic information system can be of vital importance in the preparation of plans. Mutual aid schemes shall be of great help in mobilization of resources, while mock drills shall ensure the efficiency and effectivity of response. Also, as mentioned earlier, um, training of the various functionaries and effective public awareness and education campaign involving the communities also ensure that plans are disseminated to the lowest of levels and ensure that safety will be provided to the community. Thank you. Next reporter, please. I apologize for the background noise. Uh, moving on, this is Joseph Felmonet Tala assigned to report on value at risk or VAR for short. Uh, first of all, since we're talking about risk, there's this uh, interesting saying of Brown, which essentially tells us that it's one thing to not compute for VAR, it's quite another to not know how to compute for VAR or value at risk, emphasizing that the latter could be more alarming. Now, why is that? Why is it important that we are knowledgeable about value at risk? Next slide, please. Basically, a value at risk represents loss. From the term itself, value at risk, it's meant to give us an idea or an estimate of an investment's risk. So our perspective here centers on investments or stocks and the like. In other words, it's a statistical tool or technique that we can use in measuring the potential loss of, let's say, an investment portfolio over a specified period of time. In that same sense, another definition of value at risk is that it's a threshold value. By threshold, we mean a point or a certain level that determines whether something exceeds or is below or within such. So it's a threshold value such that the probability of a portfolio making uh, making a market to a market loss over a given time frame exceeds this value. And we call that loss that exceeds the value at risk threshold as value at risk or VAR break. Again, by value at risk, we're dealing with a probable loss. Thus, a negative value at risk manifests probable profit or contrary to what value at risk represents. To deepen, deepen our understanding of value at risk, let's have this simple illustration. Assuming normal market operations and that there's no trading, what does it imply if a portfolio has a one-day 4% value at risk of 1 million? It means that there is a 0.04, that's the 4%, probability that the portfolio will decrease or be reduced by more than 1 million in value. Same example, uh, if a financial firm determines an asset has a 3% one-month value at risk of 2%, then that means there's a 0 0.03 chance of the asset to decline in value by 2%. Uh, there are more as to the technicalities or the computation and analysis surrounding value at risk, like with the probability level being specified as one minus the probability of value at risk break, uh, value at risk parameters being one and 5% probabilities and one day and two weeks time horizons, and value at risk not being sub-additive, meaning the value at risk of a combined portfolio can be larger than the sum of value at risks of its components. Nevertheless, it's a good start that we know the purpose of value at risk and that through this statistic or financial metric, like how investment and commercial banks use it, uh, we get to be aware of the probability of losing more than a given amount in a portfolio. Next slide, please. So just to supplement what we have discussed so far, here are 
uh, value at risk additional information. Uh, to say it once more, it is one of the methods of measuring financial risk. And in our learning material, it mentioned different types of value at risk. We have long-term, marginal factor, and shock value at risk. However, it also highlighted or gave focus to the two types of value at risk. The first being applied primarily in risk management and the second one in risk, risk measurement. In risk management, the manager does not just treat uh, value at risk as a mere number, but a structured system that runs periodically and as part of the management function, an update of number backed with statistical data aids in keeping a high objective standard in the organization. While in risk measurement, uh, value at risk is commonly reported alongside other measurements such as uh, the standard deviation. Uh, value at risk can be helpful too in financial control and reporting as well as in calculating regulatory capital. The same is true in monitoring the risk involved in governance of endowments trusts, and pension plans. A major advantage of value at risk is that it identifies the boundary between normal days and extreme occurrences in a systematic way. Uh, going back to our examples earlier, we assumed uh, normal market operations. Therefore, in abnormal situations, uh, value at risk is not useful. And finance managers have this big responsibility on developing plans to limit or survive the loss as much as possible. Uh, lastly, despite the benefits that come with utilizing uh, value at risk, it's been said that such concept has led to excessive risk taking and leveraging by financial institutions. Let's go to the next subtopic. Good day, I am Ivana Marie Montermoso, and I will be discussing the introduction to capital adequacy norms in banking industry. Next slide, please. Um, before anything else, let me introduce the Basel Committee, also known as the Committee on Banking Regulations and Supervisory Practices. Next slide, please. So the Basel Committee was established to enhance financial stability by improving the quality of banking supervision worldwide and to serve as a forum for um, next week, um, to serve as a forum for regular cooperation between its member countries on banking supervis supervisory matters. Since its inception, the Basel Committee has expanded its membership from the group of 10 to 45 institutions from 28 jurisdictions. The committee has established a series of international standards for bank regulation, most notably its landmark publications of the Accords on Capital Adequacy, which are commonly known as Basel I, Basel II, and most recently, Basel III. Next slide, please. Um, with the foundations for supervision of internationally active banks laid, capital ad adequacy soon became the main focus of the committee's activity. So in the early 1980s, the committee was concerned that the capital ratios of the main international banks were de deteriorating at a time of growing international risk. Backed by the group of 10 governors, they resolved to stop the erosion of capital standards in their banking system and to work towards greater convergence in the measurement of capital adequacy. There was strong recognition with the committee of the overriding need for a multinational accord to strengthen the stability of the interna international banking system and to remove a source of competitive inequality arising from differences in national capital requirements. So a capital requirement, a capital measurement system commonly referred to as the Basel Capital Accord was approved by the group of 10 governors and released to banks in July 1988. Um, it is a set of minimal capital requirements for banks, and um, this became law in group of 10 countries in 1922 with Japanese banks being permitted to an extended transition period. So next slide, please. Um, to understand the scope of the 1988 accord, we need to clarify what we mean by banks. Next slide. Under its Glass-Steagall Act, U.S. made a distinction between commercial banks and securities firms or investment banks. 
The mixing of commercial and investment banking was considered to be risky and speculative and widely considered to be a culprit that led to the Great Depression. But in 1999, USA revoked this act. So in 1988, Basel I primarily addressed banking in the sense of deposit taking and lending. So its focus was credit risk. Um, bank assets were assigned risk weights. Generally, group of 10 government debt was weighted 0%, um, group of 10 debt was weighted 20%, and other debt was weighted 100%. Following this, the government of India securities were assigned zero risk weights. Having assigned an aggregated risk, banks were required to hold capital equal to 8% of the risk weighted value of assets. Additional rules are applicable to contingent obligations such as letters of credit of der or derivatives. Next slide, please. Um, with banks increasingly taking market risk in the early 1990s, the Basel Committee decided to update the 1988 Accord to include bank capital requirements for market risk. Any capital requirements adopted for banks' market risk were to be incorporated into future updates of Europe's Capital Adequacy Derivative, or CAD, and thereby apply to Britain's non-bank securities firms. So if the same framework were extended outside Europe, then it could harmonize globally. So in 1992, the Basel Committee, the Basel Committee and the International Organization of Securities Commission, or IOSCO, jointly developed a technical, a technical committee. Next slide, please. Um, banks were primarily exposed to credit risk. They often held illiquid portfolios of loans supported by deposits, which could be liquidated rapidly only at fire sale prices. This placed banks at risk of runs. If depositors feared that a bank might fail, they would withdraw their deposits. Forced to liquidate its loan portfolio, the bank would succumb to staggering losses on those sales. Though deposit insurance and lender of last resort provisions implemented eliminated risk of bank returns, they introduced a new problem. Depositors no longer had an incentive to consider a bank's financial viability before depositing funds. Without such marketplace discipline, um, regulators were forced to intervene often at a huge cost to the exchequer or the national treasury. So, um, one solution was to impose minimal capital requirements on banks because of the high cost of liquidating and because of the high cost of liquidating a bank. Such requirements were generally based upon the value of a bank as a going concern. Next slide, please. Um, the primary objective behind stipulation of capital requirements for securities firms was to protect clients who might have funds or securities on deposit with a, with a firm. So securities firms were primarily exposed to market risk. They held liquid portfolios of marketable securities supported by secured financing such as repos or um, repurchase agreements. A troubled firm's portfolio could be unsound quickly at market prices. For this reason, capital requirements were based upon the liquidation value of the firm. So, um, next slide, please. So in a nutshell, banks entailed systematic risk. It was thought that the securities firms did not. And reg regulators would strive to keep a troubled bank afloat, but with And banks needed a long-term capital in the form of equity or long-term subordinated debt, while securities firms could operate with more transient capital, including short-term subordinated debt. Next slide, please. In April 1993, the Basel Committee released a package of proposed amendments to the 1988 Accord. This included a document proposing minim minimum re capital requirements for banks' market risk. Um, banks would be required to identify a trading book and hold capital for market, market risk under trading book and organization-wide foreign exchange exposure. Um, Capital charges for the trading book would be based upon accrued value at risk or VAR. Measure broadly consisted with a 10-day 95% VAR metric, similar to VAR measure used by Europe, 
CAD. This partially recognized hedging effects but ignored diversification effects. Next slide, please. Um, later, later, VAR measure was changed modestly from the 1993 proposal, still reflecting a 10-day 95% VAR metric. And market risk capital requirements were set equal to the greater of either the previous day's VAR or the average VAR over the previous six days multiplied by three. So now let us move on to the Basel II, which will be discussed by the next reporter. Uh, good afternoon. I am Trisha Anantulihao, and for the second part of the evolution of Basel, the Basel II. So the full title of the accord is the International Convergence of Capital Measurement and Capital Standards, a Revised Framework. Basel II refers to the second set of international banking rules passed by the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. Uh, published in 2004, this set focused on strengthening the capital requirements of banks. This requires financial institutions to maintain enough cash reserves to cover risk incurred by operations. This also replaced the 1988 Accord or the Basel I in April 2006. It includes a more sophisticated treatment of credit risk and addressed operational risk, among other things. Broadly speaking, Basel II aims to encourage better and more systematic risk management practices. It provides improved measures of capital adequacy for the benefit of super supervisors and the marketplace more generally. Moreover, under the Basel II regime, banks need to implement sound processes and systems to ensure that they are adequately capitalized at all times in view of all material risks. Next, to ensure that the regulatory capital requirements are more in line with economic capital requirements of banks, and by this, make capital allocation of banks more risk sensitive. This mandates that banks holding riskier assets should be required to have more capital on hand than those maintaining a safer portfolios. Basel II also requires companies to publish both the details of risky investments and risk management practices. This Basel is based on the three main pillars. Such pillars are for evaluating bank performance. First, we have the minimum capital requirements, supervisory review process, and market discipline. The illustration here shows the structure of the second Basel framework. Each pillar will be discussed in detail as we move along. This chart is the architecture of Basel II. It explains the various approaches for calculating Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 risk capital. For credit risk requirement under the first pillar, there are three approaches. Standardized approach, foundation I IRB, an advanced IRB approach. Under the new Basel regulatory capital requirement, or the first pillar, interest risk in trading book continues to carry a minimum capital charge. This pillar provides guidelines for calculation of minimum regulatory capital ratios. So first we have the standardized approach. This reports the risk weighted assets for various credit exposures, depending on their external rating positions, and hence, compute capital requirement for credit risk. Finally, such weight risk must be added and multiplied by 9% to estimate minimum capital requirement for taking credit risk. So here we have the amount of loan times the risk weight times 9% and we get the re capital required to be held against any given loan. Next is or the second approach we have foundation internal rating based approach or the FIRB approach. For this approach, banks are allowed to develop their own empirical model to estimate the PD or the probability of default for individual clients or group of clients. Banks can use this approach only subject to approval from their reg local regulators. Lastly, we have the uh, we have the third approach under the credit risk capital requirement. It 
the advanced internal rating-based approach or the advanced IRB approach. In this approach, banks are supposed to use their own quantitative models to estimate the probability of default, exposure at default, or EAD, loss of given default, and other parameters required for calculating the risk-weighted assets. So for measuring market risk, there are, two, there are two approaches, the standardized approach and the internal value at risk model. The standardized approach requires banks to report capital requirement for interest rate risk, equity position risk, and foreign exchange risk to the regulator. On the other hand, VAR models are used by banks to estimate figure for unexpected loss and operational risk capital subject to the regulatory review and approval. This model is for advanced approaches, which can be used coupled with stress testing exercises to estimate cap market risk capital charge. Uh, for the last uh, component of the first pillar, we have the operational risk. For operational risk capital estimation, there are three approaches. Basic indicator approach, or the BIA, the standardized approach, or the TSA, and advanced measurement approach, or the AMA. Uh, under the BIA, the capital charge is derived as a fixed multiple, which is the uh, alpha is equal to 15% of three years average gross income of banks. While TSA, different business lines are assigned individual gross activity measures, and the regulators determine the appropriate fixed multiple beta to calculate the regulatory capital requirement. The exposure indicator is gross income of various business lines in the, of the bank. The beta values range from 12% to 18%. Lastly, under the advanced measurement approach, banks have to use their internally defined risk parameters based on their historical intern loss and frauds, business disruption and system failures execution, delivery, and process, transaction processing risk, as employment practices, business practices, and etc. Loss history represents the inherent operational risk and the state of the controls at a point in time. Moving on to the second pillar of this framework. The second pillar of the Basel II provides the framework of, for national regulatory bodies to deal with various types of risks including systematic risk, liquidity risk, and legal risks. What is new is that interest rate risk in the banking book needs to be assessed in the review of capital adequacy in this pillar. So the first component in the internal capital adequacy assessment process, or the ICAAP, under this, credit institutions must have effective systems and processes in place to determine the amount composition and distribution of internal capital on an ongoing basis and to hold capital commensurate with the required level. Second component is the supervisory review and evaluation process or the SREP. The purpose of this is to evaluate bank's risk profile to assess qualitative aspects and to impose supervisory measures if necessary. In addition, supervisors would conduct a detailed examination of the ICAAP of the banks and, if warranted, could prescribe a higher capital requirement over and above the minimum requirement in the first pillar. So lastly, the third pillar is about market discipline as it provides various disclosure requirements for banks, risk exposures, risk assessment processes, and capital adequacy, which are helpful for users of financial statements. The purpose of this is to ensure greater transparency in terms of banks' activities and risk strategies, as well as to enhance comparability across credit institutions, which are all in the interest of market participants. This pillar is based on the premise that market would be quite responsive to disclosures. The banks would be duly rewarded or penalized in tune with the nature of disclosures. This recognizes the fact that apart from regulators, banks are also monitored by markets. Lastly, this pillar does not entail additional capital requirements, but are limited to mandating the publication of key data 
the disclosure of which neither weakens banks' competitive positions nor violates banking secrecy. That concludes the discussion on the Basel II framework. Good afternoon. This is Jocelyn Almirante, and I'm going to discuss about the comparison, comparison between Basel I and Basel II. So it is the same for the first two factors, which is capital adequacy based on risk-weighted assets. Risk-weighted assets, assets is a banking term that refers to an asset classification system that is used to determine the minimum capital that banks should keep as a reserve to reduce the risk of insolvency. Therefore, it measures a bank's financial stability by measuring its available capital as a percentage of its risk-weighted credit exposure. For the second factor, Basel I is not risk-sensitive or prescriptive, which means that it follows an enforced rule or method. On the other hand, Basel II is risk-sensitive. Next factor, in Basel I, all credit exposures carried risk weight of 100%, while in Basel II, risk weight will depend on the credit qualities. Lastly, risk capital is equivalent to credit exposure multiplied by risk weight multiplied by 8%. Basel II is just like Basel I. However, efficient banks can have lesser capital than, than the others. To summarize the implications, under Basel I, banks with good quality assets had no incentives. Low-rated exposures were subsidized by high-rated high exposures and no provision for economic pricing by banks. Under Basel II, Banks with good quality assets had incentives. Better quality asset, assets requires lesser capital. Risk pricing can be done by banks on credit risk prescription. And lastly, provision exists for economic pricing. Now let's talk about Basel III. Next slide, please. It was released by the Reserve Bank of India in May 2012 that serves as the capital regulation of India. It became... Um, it became effective from January 1, 2013 and fully implemented on March 31, 2018. This entails higher global minimum capital standards for banks to restore confidence in the, regula uh, in the regulatory framework for banks and to ensure safe and stable global banking system. It sets out the following. First, higher and, quali uh, and better equity capital. Second is better risk coverage. Third is introduction of a leverage ratio. Fourth, measures to promote the build-up of capital for periods of stress. And lastly, introduction of new liquidation standards. It states that the common equity should be at least 5.5%, which is 1% higher from the original Basel III rule, and minimum Tier 1 capital should be at least 7% of total risk-weighted assets. The regulations expect, expects that banks to understand the importance of people's perception. It also placed emphasis on liquid assets should be efficient enough to cover the cash outflow. Next slide, please. Moving forward, the two, liquid, uh, two liquidity standards are proposed. First is the liquid cover, uh, coverage ratio or LCR, which is the ratio of liquid assets to net cash flow for short short-term or 30 days liquidity management. Second is net stable funding ratio for long-term liquidity management. In LCR or liquid coverage ratio, the regulator expects that it should be more than 100%. This serves as an indicator for banks' resilience under stress situation. It requires banks to have sufficient high quality liquid assets. On the other hand, NSFR or net stable funding ratio aims to limit over over-reliance on wholesale funding during times of buoyant market liquidity and encourages better assess assessment of liquidity risk across all on and off balance sheet items. Basel, um, Basel III wants to ensure banks' leverage ratio should be greater than 3%, and then it urges banks to maintain high credit ratings to ensure greater solvency and, of course, to avoid cost of raising additional capital under unavoidable market conditions. That ends our report. Thank you for listening. We hope you learned something. Keep safe.